It is Friday, September 23rd, 2011. This is InfoWars Nightly News. And I don't know, this thing's probably going to be two hours long tonight. So if you're looking for an info babe who's got collagen injections in her lips or some disinfo agent reading off a teleprompter, I'm here to tell you you got the wrong place. This operation here at InfoWars.com is so dedicated to liberty that I had to turn back some of the news today. The crew is so, so energized, so hardworking. The amount of research, I can't even get up here and do justice to what's coming up. Peter Dell Scott on government drug dealing and more. Uh, we've got in studio the maker of American Dream exposing the banking cartel, Tad Lumpkin. Uh, we have got on-site reporting from Darren McBreen and Aaron Dykes who are in Colorado with a huge martial law drill. That's coming up first in a moment. We've got this cancer story that is just so jam-packed we're going to be lucky to even be able to get all this in tonight. So let's go ahead and launch into it right now. First off, uh, Operation Mountain Guardian Emergency Response Exercise. I found out about this yesterday afternoon, and I've missed all the big drills in Colorado. Uh, over the years, I've learned that the biggest martial law drills are held in Denver. And uh, we were not disappointed, uh, complete with practicing to round up school kids and others and bring them to sports stadiums. Uh, all a exercise in federalization and the takeover of the community over a hundred uh, agencies, uh, police coming up and telling our crew to turn off their cameras. It was all compartmentalized in other areas. Our crew was able to get into a public school where they had even kids as young as uh, six years old, first grade, going through this. And then, of course, the uh, Catholic charities involved taking folks there to the uh, Denver NFL football a stadium just amazing and we there's got to be like 30 different upload video reports that are at infowars.com and prisonplanet.tv right now on this uh, i want to go ahead and go to one of those reports right now are we going to aaron first or darren mcbrain all right here's aaron dykes reporting from denver now, we've been in the Denver metro area today covering a widespread martial law takeover drill within the city known as Operation Mountain Guardian. That operation is sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security. We saw earlier today a Mumbai-style attack at a, at a suburban mall in the area. There was also a staged attack on a train and bus facility. Then later this morning, we witnessed a SWAT-style raid against an elementary school where they staged a shooting. And then what we learned there was that the children from that staged shooting were being relocated at the sports stadium you see directly behind me. We then investigated what was going on at the sports stadium and found in their own press releases admissions that they were planning to test the relocation processing of students and teachers during this drill. The, we were then tipped off by security personnel on this side of the stadium that indeed buses had brought children into the stadium, but no media or press was allowed inside. When we came around to the South End Tunnel, we witnessed those buses as well as vehicles from the uh, from the Denver Public School Safety and Security Department, including the supervisor. Uh, following that, we spoke to a a stage mother, a mock mother, who was here to pick up children from the facility, which led us to then talk to Denver Police Victims Response Unit Head uh, Scott Snow, the Victim Assistance Unit, and he told us that indeed the end goal of this exercise or any real event that might happen was to get the children to this stadium where the parents could then be reunified with well, them. Well, this kind of ties up as far as I mean, the whole goal of this Family Information Center is to yeah. give a both parents a responding point for PIOs, public information, to okay. stage out here. Okay. Yeah, additional information. Okay, so this is pretty much it, though, like the end of the... Yeah, the yeah and this is about done. Like, yeah, it's yeah, for, yeah, in terms of drill or even yeah. a real event, this is the yeah. goal is to get everybody here to reunify with parents or okay. guardians. Okay. Just incredible events as we see more and more of a federalization of police and military and a total takeover of these metro areas in a fear-mongering panicking for a terrorism event. Alex, back to you. Okay, great job, Aaron. Uh, as we go out to break in a little while... Uh, and uh, come back with our first in-studio guest. We're going to play a report from Darren McBreen, all filed and 
put together there on the ground, uh, amazing new technologies that are really empowering alternative and grassroots media. And again, that police officer there, nice guy, trying to be helpful, doing a drill to reunite children. Just so happens we broke the news 10 years ago that FEMA actually plans to take your children to sports stadiums and then make you come turn your guns in to get them back. And so it's all an exercise in the government basically taking people to a sports stadium and the cover is children, but it's also training the police to take uh, political dissidents to sports stadiums as has been declassified in Rex 84 and other FEMA programs that we'll be talking about with Peter Dale Scott, an expert on COG, continuity of government and martial law uh, coming up. But for now, that's it for our coverage. This is just about federalization, drill, fear-mongering to create the perception that terrorism is this big threat. You've got a better chance of slipping on ice and dying or uh, dying in a car wreck. Hundreds of times better chance of that or being killed by bees or snake bite. And uh, the bottom line is government can't and won't be able to protect you uh, from the dangers that are out there in this world, whether it be carjackings or a lightning strike whether it be man-made or good old Mother Nature. Now, uh, we just got this news in in the last hour or so, and Ron Paul, again, the Fox News um, geolocating one-time scientific polling system showed that Ron Paul got double the votes, right at double the votes of the other candidates, and we screenshotted this and pointed it out. Uh, but then, after Drudge Report linked to it, uh, Fox News simply took down the poll. And so that's a whole new story. Uh, Mitt Romney got 22.89%, Perry 12.8%, Newt Gingrich 699 Ron Paul 39.27%, so almost double. And as we keep seeing in all the other scientific polls and exit polls uh, and sh straw polls, that's what we continue to see at all of these events, is that in every case, Ron Paul is getting about double, sometimes more than double. And when he won the NBC debate a few weeks ago, they just they just didn't report it. and said that Rick Perry had won it. And it just continues to happen. That's how scared they are to keep him from becoming the front runner. He really is the front runner. Uh, Ron Paul, I really disagree with him, but he said in the debate last night, he said, I'm now the third tier candidate. I mean, I, I'm now number three, so I'm a top tier, but I'm, I'm in third place and I want to be first place. Ron Paul won the New Hampshire straw poll. He came in second place uh, at the Iowa straw poll. He's won all the debates. He won the California straw poll. He's raising more money than even the establishment candidates. He's, he's getting 70 plus percent of the military donations. And if they weren't running this hoax that he couldn't win, he would be the undisputed front runner. Uh, but regardless, uh, he won CPAC poll two years in a row, and they dubbed in booing Fox News did this year. So there you have it. They like these big government Republicans, Mitt Romney, uh, and uh, people like Rick Perry, totally and absolutely disgusting. So Fox News poll, Ron Paul wins, Orlando debate, and then Fox News poll uh, is pulled, showing Ron Paul debate victory, and Fox News claims that Mitt Romney has won. But thank God the Drudge Report, Matt Drudge, uh, is bucking the rhinos and exposing that. But that's about it. Fox News is still sitting there suckering their viewers. Now, you know that uh, Big Sis came out and criticized the alternative media um, two weeks ago and said, stop calling her Big Sis. Stop calling her a, what was the term she used? An ogre? Nobody's calling you an ogre. We're calling you Mr. Mr. Napolitano. Uh, and she is a police state thug, but she's just a front person, a puppet at the end of the day. But now showing the fact that they're bowing to pressure, I mean, she wouldn't be whining to Politico if they weren't. A petition to abolish TSA appears at White House website. And uh, we confirmed this. I, I, I checked it three times. It is whitehouse.gov. And they say abolish the TSA and use the monstrous budget to fund more sophisticated, less intrusive counterterrorism intelligence. Now, I'd love to believe this is them capitulating, and it is to a certain extent, but they've always planned to put a bunch of biometric face scanning, uh, trusted traveler stuff in place. That's why they're grabbing your genitals now, so you'll accept the national ID card internal passport to travel. But this has backfired on them so bad that now they want to go ahead uh, and, and, and start moving towards the Big Brother 
uh, system now. So that's certainly uh, important news. Now I want to get to the most important story of the night. And you notice all week we've been covering this. We've been, we've been talking about vaccines. Uh, we've had multiple medical doctors on, Andrew Wakefield, Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, and others uh, to go over the fact this is a premeditated eugenics operation to implant the population with soft kill uh, cancer viruses, amongst other programs, including reduced fertility and outright sterilization. And I'm going to play a video clip uh, coming up in a few minutes of one of the top Merck scientists, one of the co-developers of some of the most famous vaccines out there uh, from a PBS documentary produced in Boston where, you know, he, he had, well, our, I mean, the full interview uh, is online. We're actually sending off to the station to get the original. I saw this more than a decade ago, but now it's on the Internet cut up in lots of different pieces. We're going to play one of those here. Uh, but 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 this is the, uh, one of the top vaccine developers. Earlier, he admits that yeah, AIDS came from monkeys that they they use the kidneys for. But that's not even in this report. We'll do that next week. Just oh yeah, the government created AIDS. Ha ha ha. You know, uh, yeah, it's in the vaccines. But then he goes on and says, yeah, we found out there was uh, cancer viruses that cause leukemia in the vaccines and all these others. Now now we don't need him to laugh, and, and he since died. Uh, this interview was done more than a decade ago laugh about it to know that this is true. I have new scientists, the rest of it, admitting this. But that's why breast cancer has tripled since 1980. Uh, that's why, uh, in general, most types of cancers have doubled in the last decade. So most of that growth is just in the last 10 years. That's, that's why we're having all these autoimmune responses in the pancreas and the brain, and the increase of autism, uh, and of course, um, things like diabetes. I mean, you know, here's the UK government with UN numbers breaking it down, you notice that the most vaccinated countries in the world are Australia and New Zealand and North America, and uh, they have the highest cancer rates in the world. And then right beneath that, Europe is a close third uh, behind the Britannic nations. That's really what the US, Canada, England, Australia, New Zealand are, is globalist commonwealths. In fact, let's replay that again. I want people to, to uh, see this map. Uh, and, and again, notice, and, and you can go check the numbers, the highest vaccination areas in the world all correspond with the highest rates of cancer. Australia, New Zealand, most vaccination, most cancer. Uh, North America, Canada, the U.S., second highest. Western Europe, third highest. Northern Europe, fourth highest. Southern Europe, again, it, it follows it precisely right through. And uh, look at uh, the Middle East. Uh, look at Africa, where they run from the vaccines and, and have figured out that, uh, that the medicine man's coming to kill their butt. <laughs> They've got the lowest levels out there. Absolutely uh, incredible uh, to, to see uh, that information. Okay, now, I've gone over the global cancer rates. Uh, massively increasing, and you get varied numbers, but conservatively doubled in the last 30 years. But a lot of rare types have more than quadrupled. Some types of lung cancer, uh, more than sevenfold. Um, it's just mind mind blowing to see all of this. Uh, now, continuing, I want to talk about all the well-meaning mothers and fathers who shave their heads to raise cancer awareness, and all the jogging events and sporting events. And I have friends and family that go to them and you know pay money to run in races to donate it and. And they'll show some little kids saying, I'm going to die in the next month. Please give money to the cancer research, on and on and on. Well, look, all they do with chemotherapy is charge you tens of thousands of dollars a month for a cheap bug poison. And that's all it is, is patented bug poison approved. And they love kids because they can fight and live a long time. So big pharma can, can, uh, can uh, suck a lot of money uh, out of them. You know, instead of just being useful idiots for the New World Order, how about we talk about why breast cancer has tripled or why this is becoming so epidemic worldwide, but especially uh, in the West? Uh, I mean, why don't we actually look at the causes of this? I mean, here's some of the stories. Teams across the country lace up for pediatric cancer. 46 mothers shave their heads for childhood cancer awareness. Young Nuggets fan inspired others during valiant cancer fight. Race teams run for pediatric cancer. Well, let's just go over now some of the uh, causes. 60 lab studies now confirm cancer link to a vaccine you probably had as a child. 
That, of course, is the polio shot. And by the way, it's still in there. Uh, here's another one. Science. Uh, polio vaccine linked to cancer. And that's new scientists, uh, you name it, uh, all reporting on that. Now, let's look at some of the others. Uh, here's London Guardian. Fluoride water causes cancer. Boys at risk for bone tumors. Yeah, seven-fold increase in boys, three-fold in girls. Shock research reveals. That's been out since the 30s. It's not shock research. Study links fluoride to bone cancer in men. Web MD. Uh, on and on and on. So they've been adding this to the water, along with hundreds of other chemicals in, in the cover name of fluoride. You see, how about instead of giving money to the big pharma companies that basically use the cancer research systems uh, as a way to suppress the real cures and treatments and to control the debate and research. Instead of just being gullible and, 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 and giving your little girl stuff in bisphenol A cups and giving people the GMO and all the lab studies that gives lab rats cancer and then drinking the sodium fluoride and giving them all the shots, how about you actually find out? Instead of just going, man, let's find a cure, how about we find out what's causing it to begin with? It's like, let's find out a way if, a, if an 18-wheeler runs over you and breaks you know, 50 bones, let's find a way to fix those bones quicker. How about we just find out why people are playing in interstate traffic? High, uh, traffic. See what I'm saying? Instead of, hey, uh, people are falling off 50-story uh, buildings and dying, uh, let's figure out how to make people bounce better and not die and hit the bottom. How about we just don't jump off buildings? I mean, I'm just throwing some analogies out here, or parables right now, uh, to try to get you to think. Why don't we talk about why it's increasing, why it's skyrocketing? Just so happens all of all these government documents we covered the last two nights here, where it's all engineered, where it's eugenics. Now, this is a long clip, and uh, this is from a WGBH. I remember seeing this online a decade ago, and I can't dig up the original, but we're going to order it and, and, and figure out how to get a copy. Or if you have one, please send it to us. Of course, when this guy died in 2005, they praised him. This is from an online compilation uh, where uh, you know, people basically cut it up. But it's Dr. Maurice Hilleman uh, talking uh, about how uh, there was cancer viruses in the vaccines. Uh, you name it, all different types of cancers. Very powerful information. Stay with us. Well, I got an invitation from the Sister Kinney Foundation, you know, which was the opposing foundation, and that was the live virus. All right. Yeah, they had jumped on Sabin's bandwagon. Mm -hmm. And they had asked me to come down and give a talk at, at the Sister Kenny Foundation meeting. And I said, it was an international meeting. I thought, God, what am I going to talk about? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about the detection of non-detectable viruses as a topic. So now i got to have something, you know, that's going to attract attention. <laughs> So I thought, gee, that damn SB40, I mean, that, that damn that vacuolating agent that we have, I'm going to just pick that particular one. Mm -hmm. That virus has got to be in, in vaccines, and uh, it's got to be in Sabin's vaccine, so I quickly tested it. <laughs> sure enough, it was in there. And I'll be damned. So now, uh, so I go ahead and... Uh, so you just took stocks of Sabin's vaccine off the shelf here at Merck? Yeah, well, it had not been made at Merck. It was made at Merck. You were making it for Sabin at this point? Yeah, it was made before I came. Yeah, but at this point, Sabin is still just doing these massive field trials. Mm -hmm. Okay. In Russia and so forth. So I go down, I talked about the... Um, the detection of non detected virus. And I told Albert. Uh, but at this point, Sabin is still just doing these massive field trials. Mm -hmm. Okay. In Russia and so forth. So I go down, I talked about the, um, the detection of non detected virus. And I told Albert, I said, listen, Albert, I said, you know, you and I are good friends. But I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down there and you're going to get upset. But I'm going to talk about a virus that's in your vaccine. Now, you're going to get rid of the virus. Don't worry about it. You're going to get rid mm -hmm. of it. But, um, um, so of course, Albert was very upset with me. And what did he say? Well, he said basically that this, this is just another obfuscation that is going to upset vaccines. I said, well, you know, you're absolutely right. But I said, we have a new era here. We have a new era of a detection. And the important thing is to get rid of these viruses. Why would he call it an obfuscation if it was a virus that was contaminating well, no, vaccines? Because, we, well, there are 40 different viruses in these vaccines anyway that we were inactivating. And uh, 
But you weren't activating the that his level. That's correct. No, that's right. But she, yellow fever vaccine had leukemia yeah. virus in it, and you know, this is in the days of very crude science. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I went down and talked to him, and I said, "Well, why are you concerned about it?" I said, "Well, I'll tell you what. I said I have a feeling in my bones that this virus." is different. I, I don't know why to tell you this, but I've been around biology a long time. I just think this virus may have some long-term effects. Mm -hmm. And he said, what? Mm -hmm. I said, oh, cancer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love it. And I love it. Go ahead. Yeah. No. I said, Albert, I said, I, you, you probably think I'm nuts, but I just have that feeling. Well, in the meantime, we had taken this virus and put it into monkey and into hamsters. Uh huh. So we had this meeting, and that was sort of the topic of the day. And the jokes that were going around was, "Gee, we would win the Olympics because uh, the Russians would all be loaded down with tumors." <laughs> <laughs> this is where the vaccine was being tested. This was this was yeah, right. Person. Right. So. Uh, <laughs> And it really destroyed the meeting. You know, it was a big interaction. Yeah, right. So it was sort of a topic. No. Why didn't this get out in the press? Well, I guess it did. I don't remember. We had no press release on it, obviously. You don't go out. This is a scientific affair within the scientific mm -hmm. community. Again, uh, I saw this a decade ago online, and it's since been grabbed and chopped up. Uh, we're going to try to get the original uh, from WGBH Public Television, Boston, of Dr. Maurice Hilleman. Uh, this is from several decades ago, but I, again, I saw it online when video was first becoming popular on the web, and that's what people have gotten off the web and caught up. That's why the quality uh, is so low. Our early video streaming on the web was more like a slideshow. Uh, as you know, but uh, this video clip has been getting more attention again lately. But I just want to remind you, in fact, here it is right here. I had it down here. Uh, you can go to, uh, give me a document cam shot. Again, you can find thousands of mainstream news articles. Here's New Scientist uh, with the headline, Science Polio Vaccine Linked to Cancer, SV40. It's just interesting to see the guy uh, sitting there uh, making jokes about all of this. And and then er earlier in the in the interview, he talks about, uh, HIV from monkeys they use for vaccines and ha 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 it was being tested in Russia and it was killing Russians so so what and it, it really gives you a mindset into these people because as he said we didn't even bother to warn anybody just screw it why warn anybody now I want to get to another clip here that is from University of Calgary uh, up in Canada, where they did an electron microscope scan of what happens when mercury uh, hits brain cells. And so you've got the sodium fluoride, the mercury, the cancer viruses, all of this, and you wonder why there's all these uh, neurological disorders. And then it cuts into a local Austin newscast that was actually packaged nationally. This aired on all the local CBS affiliates. They just read off a teleprompter and have a video package over it so it has the local view. But this aired on every CBS station in the country telling people that mercury is now good for your children's brains. Here it is. To better understand mercury's effect on the brain, let us first illustrate what brain neurons look like and how they grow. In this animation, we see three brain neurons growing in a tissue culture, each with a central cell body and numerous neurite processes. At the end of each neurite is a growth cone where structural proteins are assembled to form the cell membrane. Two principal proteins involved in growth cone function are actin, which is responsible for the pulsating motion seen here, and tubulin, a major structural component of the neurite membrane. Shown here is the neurite of a live neuron isolated from snail brain tissue, displaying linear growth due to growth cone activity. It is important to note that growth cones in all animal species, ranging from snails to humans, have identical structural and behavioral characteristics and use proteins of virtually identical composition. In this experiment, neurons also isolated from snail brain tissue were grown in culture for several days, after which very low concentrations of mercury were added to the culture medium for 20 minutes. Over the next 30 minutes, the neurite membrane underwent rapid degeneration, leaving behind the denuded neurofibrils seen here. In contrast, 
Other heavy metals added at this same concentration, such as aluminum, lead, cadmium, and manganese, did not produce this effect. Shown here is a neurite growth cone stained specifically for tubulin and actin, before and after mercury exposure. Note that the mercury has caused disintegration of tubulin microtubule structure. These new findings reveal important visual evidence as to how mercury causes neurodegeneration. More importantly, this study provides the first direct evidence that low-level mercury exposure is indeed a precipitating factor that can initiate this neurodegenerative process within the brain. Mercury-containing vaccines may help not harm kids, according to two new studies in the journal Pediatrics. There have been widespread concerns that mercury-based preservatives in vaccines might impair the neurological development of children. These new studies suggest that the opposite, that the preservatives may actually be associated with improved behavior and mental performance. So mercury uh, literally annihilates brain cells like no other heavy metal in microscopic amounts, much lower than what they're injecting into kids. But if you read off a teleprompter, it's magic. It's absolute magic. And all these brain damaged kids and the lowering IQs in the West and the skyrocketing cancer, it's all just a big accident. But that Merck scientist said, we just gave it to the Russians to kill their ass. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun. Trust the government. They love you now, and you know they do. I shouldn't get upset, should I? I shouldn't be up here at night fighting the globalist. I shouldn't be obsessed with this. I, I shouldn't have had those nightmares last night knowing they're killing us on purpose. I should just shave my head for all the kids dying around me of cancer. I've got a bunch of people in the office with girlfriends and young people dying of cancer. I should just shave my head and go for a jog and feel real good and give some money to the killers instead of actually finding out they're doing it to us on purpose. Because you don't want to actually save anybody. You just want to feel good. So I apologize. I really do. Well, I, uh, I don't know what to say right now. We're going we're gonna to go to a Darren McBreen report here from... Uh, the martial law takeover federalization drills in Denver, Colorado, and then we'll, we'll be right back. Stay with us. Hey, we're here in Denver, Colorado, and we're covering Operation Mountain Guardian. Now, this is a large-scale terrorism drill, and 100 different agencies actually took part in the exercise. Now, this was a test for Homeland Security and FEMA to test their capabilities in what they referred to as a catastrophic situation involving a terrorist attack. One of the primary locations of the drill took place right behind me at the uh, Sports Authority Field where the exercise involved participants processing children in and out of the FEMA camp that they set up inside of the stadium. Now authorities kept us from entering the stadium compound but we have confirmed that it was indeed, it was indeed used as a relocation facility for children's and teachers who were part of the drill. Now Aaron Dykes is coming up next, he's kind of going to give us a bullet point breakdown of the events that we witnessed today. I'm Darren McBreen for InfoWars Nightly News, Prison Planet TV, InfoWars.com. Obama is notoriously a liar. We need to go to where the real architecture of government is, and it's not in a president. Wall Street has hijacked Washington in broad daylight. Well, Obama's already fudging. He's yeah. fudged since day one in this election. The elite are using Obama to pacify the public so they can usher in the North American Union by stealth, launch a new Cold War, and continue the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. The globalists are outside all the nations. That gives them safety, and they play countries off against each other. You've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. It is the only way. What they're doing is using the existence of the United States to act out their Wall Street fantasies of world domination and maintaining 
their capital structures and maintaining their system of looting. The fight that this country has been waging since its inception is for the central bankers not to take over the country. President Barack Obama is only the tool of a larger agenda. Senator Obama had a desire to do some meetings. Others had a desire to meet with him tonight in a private way, and that's what we're doing. Presidential candidate Barack Obama was publicly criticizing the North American Free Trade Agreement in a bid for votes, but privately telling Canadian officials not to worry about it. If you talk to our generals, they are desperate for is a civilian uh, counterpart to our military force. What do you call this thing where you get this false sense of gratification, but, but because a black man is in office, everything's going to be all right? No, everything's not going to be all right. So I know how unpopular it is to be seen as helping banks right now, especially when everyone is suffering in part from their bad decisions. I promise you, I get it. The Obama deception, the truth strikes back. Get your copy of the Obama deception today at InfoWars.com or download it in super high quality at PrisonPlanet.tv. Okay, we're recording now, Jones, so whenever, uh, whenever you're ready. All right. Stupid monkey suit. Um, okay. All right, my friends, we're back. It's InfoWars Nightly News, and in studio, we've got Tad Lumpkin, the director of the amazing animated film documenting the history of the banking cartel, American Dream, because you've got to be asleep to believe it. Uh, this is definitely cyanide to the globalist. Tad, great to have you here hey, with us. Hey, great. Thanks for having me, Alex. Listen, uh, obviously, we're, we're promoting the film. We've got it in the InfoWars store. You guys have been great. You've put it out for free on the web, showing it's really about the passion uh, for liberty to fight the collectivist Borg. I wanted to have you here because last time, uh, you know, we had you via video connection. It was powerful stuff. I wanted to have you here to talk about your philosophy and give us a hint of some of the new projects coming out. Well, I mean, uh, the, the, our overall philosophy is one where we feel like the path to um, human prosperity and the path to having uh, uh, the greatest life that you can is one that's based on individual liberty. And so all our, all our media, and the reason that we made the, the Federal Reserve uh, doc was because we felt like people don't understand how these things work and how they go towards this sort of collectivist mentality that takes all people's individual identity puts them into a collective and just merely makes them sort of a cog in a machine. And you're looking at who's running the collective. The collectivists never think about, well, who, who programs this? They're always saying, we'll have a giant computer. That's one of their things that will run everything. Well, who programs the computer? Well, I mean, basically what happens is, is you sort of got two levels of people. You have people who are completely sold into this philosophy and understand it and have reached a level of power that they can install it and then there's the people who sort of zombie follow the the power a lot of politicians and things like that they do these things because they just want to get ahead in the world and they want to they want to get rich they want to have more power and sure, so they short sort term. of go along 
Right. And then there's other people who are wholly sold out to an idea that, you know, we need to control things, not only for our own wealth and gain, but to make sure that our that our personal long term existence comes at all costs, regardless of what that so is. So basically, you want to legalize freedom and let individual free will uh, be the ultimate goal. Basically, you're an extremist terrorist. <laughs> By some by by some people, yes, I'm sure that the uh, the extreme left would uh, would would probably call. But it. if we look at history, collectivism, command and control does not work. It creates unspeakable travesties, monstrosities, and that's why the globalists say, "Well, we're trying to be scientifically tyrannical. It'll be different this time." But we've we've seen it's not been different. I mean, even the best laid plans of mice and men often go astray, and that's what's scary about a centralized tyranny. Its mistakes are even that much bigger, and then it strives to cover them up. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And I think what happens is, is somehow there's this tolerance for uh, a certain type of uh, dehumanization of people, and then there's not of another one. I was actually talking to uh, uh, my partner on the way over here, and we were talking about the whole idea that it's like somehow you have movie stars wearing Che Guevara stuff, and it's cool, you know, and it's like in Los Angeles, there's, you know, a, a restaurant called Mao's, Chairman Mao's Kitchen. I mean, these people killed tens of millions of people in brutal ways because they were bent on building their collective. Well, Mao, admittedly, the Chinese say he killed 80 plus million. Our government says 64 million. But I mean, and, and exactly, I see young people wearing Shea shirts and Mao shirts. And, right. And like, do they have any idea just how out of control this is? And what it shows you is, is that if you brand things right, and you market ideas right, and you soften people to these things, they not only accept them, they actually elevate them and embrace them. And I mean, that's, that's what we see all, all over in just, you take one horrific thing and if you package it up right, somehow it no longer not only become, isn't horrific, it actually becomes cool. It's and, sexy, it's yeah, stylish. That's right. And, 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 and they'll defend these people uh, it's it's truly sickening because the last time I checked, Denver, Toronto, all these mega cities have Mao worship restaurants. Uh, absolutely, and you know that extends too to our to the political movement. And part of the role that we really want to play is being able to market liberty in the way that that the leftist control agenda has been marketed. I mean. Well, notice, notice, they will market, they will sell books, films, everything. That's right. And so you got to support us. But anytime a libertarian, a constitutionalist, a pro-human, a pro-freedom person yep. tries to ever build anything, it's like, how dare you make money? And, and, and then they use this guilt trip on us when they use government to take our money and then fund MSNBC with bailout money. Yep. That's moral at the point of a gun to take money. But if I sell a DVD or a book or if you do, we're evil. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And people... We need to go in and we need to get into the system that makes money and is profitable because the reason mass media and the media oligarchy is, is, is what it is, is is primarily because they do it at a big scale. So, I mean, if, if we want to get our ideas out there, we have to find a way to reach a mass audience, and that's what we want to do. We want to be able to tell the story of liberty in a way that connects to a mass market, not dilute the message, but tell it in a way that can that can rebrand it the same way Barack Obama says the same thing that Bush says before him. They're all control guys, but all they do is hope and change. And you know what? It doesn't mean anything, but people want to be a part They'll of it. They'll have a new slogan, but continue the exact same That's agenda. Right. That's right. And because, well, this guy's got browner skin than Bush, things must be different. And then folks figure that out. That's right. So now the Democrats want to throw him under the bus. You got a new puppet, so and people like a cowboy, so here comes Rick Perry to control the conservatives. Doesn't matter if he supports carbon taxes, doesn't matter if he supports Al Gore or Hillary Care or right. gun control or force inoculations or NAPA superhighways or Bilderberg group meetings. He says he's conservative. We've got to get folks past the label down to real, real action and what they stand for. We've got to build platforms to challenge them. That's what we're doing here. Right. And and that's already starting to happen. I mean, the system just still has that old old idea left. The last domino to fall is that is that they're still the mainstream media. They're not really. Right. And, and, I mean, I want you to speak to where you see this clash going in the future of collectivist control freaks versus people that love freedom. Well, I think what's going to happen is, is that as we move towards 
a sort of rebalancing of the system? Because right now, and we're seeing it in Europe, I mean, you've got all the leaders over there sticking their fingers in, in, in the leaks of the financial system, just like we bailed out all the banks and we keep doubling down on, um, on, on a, a systemically uh, not stable system. That system will have to realign at some point. When that does, that will cause massive disruption. And that will be the moment in time where we either get a lot more free or we're going to get a lot more controlled. And I think that, that, that you know, when things get bad, people tend to um, widen the, the uh, sort of spectrum that they're open to. So I think what we have to do is we need to make sure people are aware and organized and that we have the message ready to go for all the people who currently won't hear it. But we'll, we'll hear it when, when the pain pain gets a little higher. Well, that's right. If you study political science, at least from the mainline perspective, they talk about a freezing and then an unfreezing. And during crises, societies are unfrozen. That Overton window moves where people are ready for new ideas. So the controllers admit that they will create crises to try to get people to give up more rights. But as Ron Paul and many others have said, we've got to go in during the crisis when the controls uh, are, are, are available and actually try to steer people back towards liberty and away from tyranny. So there's a fight right now over the steering wheel. We're really lucky to be alive right now. I mean, this is a critical juncture. Uh, what's your view on that? Yeah, well, I do think it's a critical juncture, and I do think that's what's got to happen. And I think that people, um, like I said, as things get worse, there will be the opportunity to grab huge amounts of people. And, and look, movements don't happen. It's not gradual per se. What ends up happening is, and I try and encourage every freedom fighter out there, I say, it's more like a dam. The pressure's building behind the dam, and when you're on the other side, you can't, it doesn't look any different. And then little cracks start to form, and just a little bit of water starts to come out. The next thing you know, there's one drop that's one drop too many, and the whole thing comes down. And that's why Homeland Security's racing around for the whole apparatus of police state for patriots. That's why they're so scared. That's why they've got fear in their eyes, because they've already done the analysis of the water. They know the dam's about to fail. And I got news for them. No matter what they do, nothing's going to save them. We've gotten the word out. You've gotten the word out. The question is, how painful is it going to be when that dam breaks? We need the globalists to go ahead and just give up, run up the white flag. That's why they're only hope and prayers to tell us, that we should capitulate, that we should surrender, that, 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 you know, that tyranny's invincible. That's why they're throwing everything at us right now mm -hmm. in an attempt to run a PSYOP on us. And I'm here to tell you, Tad, it ain't going to work. No, well, and I think that the great thing is, is that most, uh, most revolutions, whether, whether they're, they're actual war revolutions or whether they're political and thought revolutions, are generally led and won by very uh, convicted minorities. It's not necessarily that you got to get 51% of people to show up to a voting booth someday to get something done. It's like when you get, you know, for better and for worse, it, things can change rather rapidly with a small percentage of highly convicted people. And you look at, like, for the worse, Cuba or, uh, you know, Russia, those were very small overthrows. I mean, Germany, things got really bad. That's how you end up getting the Nazis. On the other hand, who are the like the patriots of some country to take on the greatest empire the world's 3 ever seen? Three percent started the war. Right. Five percent won it, and that's why the globalists want to teach us we have no power. We're going to lose. We're pathetic. Nothing can beat the evil. Give up. You know, go home, GI. You're dead. Tokyo Rose stuff. Yeah. Because they understand. They just had another big university study out that was common sense, but they did a big decade long study and found. When 10% of people believe something passionately and won't back off, they will convert the other. Yes. And so whether it's global warming, man-made garbage, or whether it's liberty, 1776, it's whoever wants it most. So there's this big middle mass that's kind of sucking their thumbs and just wants to watch the football game. There's the little evil group and the little good group. And I've looked at the math. They're, that little good group is not little. Yeah. In fact, it's one of the biggest surges I've ever seen. And... Uh, 
<laughs> when you really think about it, we're going to kick their ass. Yeah. The New World Order's in deep shit, brother. Yeah, well, let me tell you what, though, is the whole reason that they, that they tell you and you see so many people scoff and laugh it off is because it's all a confidence scam, just like the banking system and yeah, the they global just financial confident. system. Right. No one's ever got sick from Gardasil, and it's like thousands and tens of thousands, and, and but it's just all a scammer. There's no mercury in the shots. They tried that for about five years well, when it's on the insert. Yep. It's or or Al Gore. Everyone knows the sea level's rising when it's dropping. Yes. Well, and I mean, you even Our see polar it. bears can't swim. Well, I mean, it's the whole thing that's like, look at all this uproar over the argument of whether Social Security is a Ponzi scheme or not. It's like, no, it 100% is a Ponzi scheme, regardless of if you like it and want to keep it. It's like they they promise things they couldn't deliver on, and, and they, they stole steal, the money to begin with. They steal the money that's in there, and then the only reason they can keep it going is because they come to your house and say, "We'll throw you in jail if you don't pay us and more." And they're always cutting how much you get, freezing the cola, stealing it through the inflation tax. Right. But because you're going to get a little bit, uh, okay, I'll go ahead, and then they take half of that little bit. Right. You know what? I'm going to give you the last two or three minutes here. I want you to look right into that camera. You're hosting the show. You're absolutely dynamite when it comes to the fact we're going to kick their butt. We're going to win this thing. You've got the floor, my friend. Uh, you, you, uh, tell them where we are right now, Tad. Well, look, we're at, a, we're at an extremely important interchange in America. And, you know, it's coming up not just in election, but it's coming up in the way people behave and what they're willing to stand for and if they're willing to be cor courageous. Because it's really going to take courage to go out and uh, deal with the fear that not only is real fear, but also fear that is is uh, is is not real but but can feel so and is part of sort of the scam of keeping you frozen and not willing to move and I would just go and tell people that you know we've got to seize this opportunity and freedom is this amazing adventure that you can have but adventure takes courage and if you can't show the courage to live then really at the end of the day What's the point? So it's kind of like for the sake of our, uh, you know, for the sake of our lives, for the sake of our children's lives, uh, you know, the point of life is, is having that life experience. And without it, it's kind of like we all leave this, this earth anyway in a pretty short period of time. So we're either going to pass on a more free and more adventurous life to our children, or we're going to pass on one where they don't get to taste that and they don't really get to experience, you know, what, what it's really all about, make their decisions about what's the most important things and why we're even here. And uh, that's where I think freedom abounds for those, those eternal questions to be asked. And control does not. And so, you know, I would just, I, I hope people just take the opportunity to go out and not be afraid of the truth, but convicted to find the truth, you know, uh, r regardless of what it tells you. And, and I think often we, we think, well, if, if, if we believe something, then, then somehow that changes what's true or not. And it's like the truth is the truth, and that is what will set you free. So I hope people that will, will take that and embrace that and, and go in search of that. Well, Ted, well said. Uh, facts are stubborn things. Yes, they are. And uh, thank God they're stubborn. Um, look, our forebears weren't perfect, but they lived in a more real world where you made mistakes, you died. Mm -hmm. Now we've had such incredible technology, so such great largesse, it's allowed us to get pretty stupid. Yeah. It's allowed us to go further down the road of uncommon sense than we've ever seen. But when that pendulum swings, it's going to be violent, and we can feel it stopping and beginning to swing back, and the system is bracing itself. The greatest challenge our species has ever faced, the greatest crossroads, is now here. And it was so exciting to know that you uh, and the uh, fellow that helped you, uh, you know, uh, Harold, uh, write this great film are involved, and you were talking about some of your new projects coming out. So exciting, uh, even more powerful than the last, and it's the fact that the individual is transcendent. The individual is uh, just, just, just magic, and what free association can do is unbelievable. I go back to myself 17 years ago. Uh, it just you know, access TV, and I'm still learning every day. And I'm not using a teleprompter. And this isn't calculated. This is just blood, sweat, tears, guts, and a love of liberty. And I reach conservatively more than 10 million people a week, and it's exponentially growing. And I know, and I've seen it. So many other people I've influenced, and others have influenced that together we're going to kick this tyranny signed in. God bless you, my friend. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for coming in. The film is...
American Dream. It's available at InfoWars.com and free all over the internet. We hope you get the high quality DVD and support what the filmmakers are doing and what we're doing and get it out to folks and hopefully air it on Access TV in your area. All right, we're going to go to break and we're going to come back with Peter Dale Scott. Straight ahead, continuity of government, government drug dealing, and 9-11, the staged event. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The American dream. There's a reason they call it a dream. <laughs> Who's there? Cock-a-doodle-doo, pal. No, 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 no! I don't have any more money! My job sucks right now, please! I'll have more money next month! You can't take my house! Is that your signature? It is a private bank owned by private stockholders. A, -a, -a private bank? Do not. I'd let the name Federal fool you. If I got this money from the bank, and the bank got it from the Federal Reserve dump traps, where does the Federal Reserve get their money? They take our property away, just like Thomas Jefferson said they would. Those sons of bitches! It's the greatest theft in human history. We're back. It's InfoWars Nightly News, another extended transmission because we're desperate to warn you. We know this information, and my God, how could we not try to warn you? Hopefully, you'll take that same spirit of enlightenment and spread it on to others because night is falling fast on free societies worldwide. You've got to defeat this tyranny before it's too late. Uh, before we go to Peter Dell Scott, i got a few more stories here. Uh, Maryland... Motor Vehicles uh, System has come out with a trial in-car system that, that, that bosses you around when you go over uh, the speed limit and later will report you to police. And they're just beta testing a system that I've seen the, the federal government transportation department talk about where they're going to have these systems in your cars that track everything you do. They already admit OnStar sells all your data to the feds and insurance companies. They've actually uh, told, their, uh, told their minions that that's happening. Uh, here's a letter uh, we were sent where uh, one of our listeners has, has uh, basically uh, begun to opt into being part uh, of the system. And that's all up at Infowars.com. And finally, before we go to Peter Dell Scott, Ahmed Dinajid, who's an engineer, uh, the leader of Iran, spoke at the UN yesterday and he said that as an engineer, there's no way the towers fell from jet fuel. Well, what about Building 7? It wasn't even hit by an aircraft. And, of course, the media now seizes on this and says, well, if you don't believe the official story, you're with the evil, you know, Iranians. Uh, I don't know. I'm with physics. Uh, I'm with common sense. And I also know that the BBC reported Building 7 had fallen before it fell with the official story. And I have video police saying, get back. The government's going to blow up Building 7. So the media likes to focus on the two towers, which are clearly controlled demolitions as well. But Building 7, which was hundreds and hundreds of yards away, wasn't hit by an aircraft so here's a clip of Ahmadinejad. I'm an engineer by trade, and I understand that those mega towers could not have imploded the way they did by two jetliners flying into them. The first time I looked at those horrific pictures, I understood this is a systematic collapse of those towers. This I can say with certainty because there must have been some explosive material that was set off in sequence. پس از طرح ضرورت تشکیل کمیته حقیقتی برای روشن شدن زوایای پنهان ماجرای تلخ 11 سپتامبر که خواست دولت ها و ملت های مستقل و حتی ملت آمریکا به جای ارائه پاسخ روشن این جانب و ملت هم توسط دولت آمریکا مورد تحکیل و فشار 
قرار گرفتیم به جای تشکیل Yeah, but again, we're not supposed to look at this because uh, supposedly our enemy, the media told us, Ahmed Energid says that looks suspicious. And of course, we've got even other clips of it where you can see the bomb blast uh, going off. We're supposed to just completely buy into the official story. Of course, the owner says he blew it up in a controlled demolition. Oh, there's some, there's some video of it right before it. Oh, ooh, look, blast points. Oh, and the exact points where a controlled demolition charges will be placed. There's now 1,500 plus architects and engineers, some of them, Huge skyscraper builders, famous architects going public here in the United States, but just ignore them because because Ahmed Dinajid said it was uh, suspicious. Again, don't uh, don't uh, let your uh, lying eyes get in the way. Believe the federal government. Hell, you just heard me earlier talk about uh, federal studies through the Journal of Pediatrics that said that mercury was good for kids' brains. Ignore that electron microscope showing it being the most deadly heavy metal in brain neurons. Just. Ignore the video of Building 7, ignore that, because I bet if Ahmed Dinajid looked at that electron microscope, he'd say mercury was bad for those neurons. Well, that's it. I bet Ahmed Dinajid thinks mercury's bad for babies. <laughs> he's, an, he's an extremist. Okay, we're going to go to Peter Dale Scott. I want to conclude this special transmission with an interview with Peter Dale Scott, an amazing historian, uh, professor, researcher, the author of scores of books. Uh, he really wrote the original definitive uh, works exposing CIA drug trafficking, of course, in Vietnam and then in Latin America. He's an expert on Iran, Contra, and more. And he's got two new books out. American War Machine is his newest. And then, of course, uh, The Road to 9-11. But I wanted to get him on today because recently uh, we have seen a group of filmmakers who were able to interview Richard Clark and others uh, being threatened by the CIA if they released the names of CIA agents they discovered were basically involved in covering up the identity of the hijackers pre-9-11. This is pretty powerful stuff, and joining us is Peter Dale Scott to discuss it. Peter, thanks for joining us. Yeah, well, I'm glad to be on the show again. You know, uh, the, the it's a matter of two names who are not big names in the whole story. The big names in the story, Richard Blee and Tom Wilshire, we've known for some time now. And uh, particularly the name of uh, Richard Blee was uh, discovered by a, in a book by, this is a very important book here, Kevin Fenton. He's a, he's a, a Briton living in uh, Prague, Czechoslovakia, and he's written a whole book about how the uh, CIA withheld information from the FBI. The two names that were sensitive to the CIA are part of the story, but, but not a big part of the story. Richard Blee is absolutely central to it because he was uh, high up in the CIA's bin Laden unit, and he was also obviously a hawk. He would been pushing for a program to get the CIA on the ground with the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan for months before 9-11 uh, happened, so that it's very striking that on the one hand, he's withholding information that could have stopped 9-11 from happening. That's a general consensus from everybody, that this was vital information. If the FBI had had it, they could have uh, brought in some, maybe the majority of the hijackers. Then on the other hand, he's acting as if he wanted 9-11 to go forward. And at the same time, he's preparing a plan for what to do when there's a casus belli, and they and they are, and it's essentially what they did do. They went in on behalf of of the Northern Alliance, which was quite controversial because they they everyone knew that the Northern Alliance was an army supporting itself by drug trafficking. Speaking of drug trafficking, uh, now we see Geraldo Rivera on Fox. We see ABC News. We see BBC. I mean, I've played these clips here on air where they just admit now, okay, the troops help grow the opium and we help ship it out and we give them fertilizer, and then we worry about it once it gets to America or once it gets to Europe. And we've seen what, uh, in the last 10 years, it go from 9% of world production, according to their, our own Justice Department, to 92% of world opium, then right. producing to heroin coming out of Afghanistan. And, and, and now, back when you were exposing it in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 
uh, and, and, and Gary Webb was exposing it, they would still somewhat try to deny it. Now they just say, yeah, we grow the opium. Uh, it's no big deal. And I was telling you off air, now the El Paso Times, Chicago Tribune, have confirmed with the federal documents that indeed most of the big Mexican drug cartels are allowed to ship drugs in, and it's only the cowboys that are shut down, and that our own government shipping guns into Mexico to knock out the drug dealers' uh, competition, and it just looks exactly like Iran-Contra all over again. Well, for 50 years, the CIA has wanted to exercise its clout in parts of the world where there, there are no U.S. Army troops, and so they rely on drug proxy armies. And they started this initially in Southeast Asia, the Golden Triangle, back around 1950. And uh, what, you know, this was written about by Al McCoy in his book, The Politics of Heroin. But what Al didn't really convey is the extent to which CIA support for these armies built up the trade so that the Golden Triangle went from less than 40 tons a year. It was very minor in the world markets before the war. And then by the height of the Vietnam War, it was somewhere between 600 and 1,200 tons. And then when that shut down, almost immediately you get the Golden Crescent starting up. And the, lo and behold, the CIA is there too. And again, it's the CIA support for the uh, drug trafficking Mujahideen. They weren't all drug traffickers by any means, but most of the CIA support went to the Mujahideen who were the drug traffickers. And we see this explosive increase from maybe 100, 200 tons back in 1980 to a high of 8,200 tons in 2006. It's down a little bit, but most of what's being grown in Afghanistan right now, it gets blamed on the Taliban and the U.S. press, but only about 12% of it is Taliban uh, drugs. By far, the bulk of it is in the corrupt system that's headed by Hamid Karzai in Kabul. Exactly. Even the New York Times admits Karzai's late brother was the main opium kingpin. And, and, uh, but there's this Orwellian, uh, absurdist, uh, just beyond ridiculous, where they're sending people to jail for a small amount of narcotics here in this country. And then right. meanwhile, there's congressional hearings in the late 90s about CIA drug trafficking that your work and others helped expose, Gary Webb, of course. Uh, now, they've just got Geraldo... Tons, yes. You know, when, the, when the CIA is involved, it's in the tons. If I could just rem recall, it was late 90s, uh, the, uh, the, uh, it was the DEA discovered that there was a, a Venezuelan general, General Guillen Davila, they accused him of importing a ton of cocaine with CIA approval. The Wall Street Journal said it might have been as much as 22 tons. And uh, the man was technically indicted, but it was a sealed indictment. Nothing ever came of it. And he was, we, we next heard of the man as part of a CIA plot against Hugo Chavez uh, about four or five years ago, untouched. And the CIA guy who was implicated in that, and the DEA wanted to see him indicted, he was allowed to retire without any penalty whatsoever. This was big time stuff. This is tons. And as you say, uh, the courts are filled with people dealing with ounces. Well, I mean, expanding on that with the Sinaloa cartel uh, d declaring they work for the CIA, and then, sure enough, the government came in and said, yes, this is true, national security. I mean, that just came out last week. And so how did the cops, how do the average people out there who are kicking down doors looking for marijuana, how do they rationalize this when basically it's now an open secret that the majority of narcotics shipped into this country are brought in by CIA authorized contractors and cartels and really the only people being busted that are of any large size are cowboys. I mean there's no doubt that's happening. They've made drugs illegal because prohibition ended of alcohol. They needed a new business. By making it illegal it increases the price. How long can this phony war on drugs go as we see it destroying our society? I know they've they spent over a trillion dollars in this war on drugs, and we've only seen the consumption rates go up. I do think it's very obvious 
that a first step should be to legalize marijuana because that would take the profits out of the Mexican cartels. They don't grow cocaine there, they grow marijuana and if people could grow their own they would be growing, they would be smoking a healthier commodity than what they get for which is you know hyped up and laced with other drugs and so on. But uh, the, this is argued for by a lot of medical experts just on uh, medical grounds, but I, the, the objection, the reason it's not happening is political because the high prices of drugs is sustaining a complete narco economy which is important to the CIA. Now it's important to the DEA because that what keeps them in business. And it's important, of course, to U.S. banks who are banking, laundering the bulk of the profits from this illegal drug trade. That was my next point. Twenty years ago, you would get criticized, and you know other researchers would. Um, but now you've got to feel completely vindicated when it came out, as you know, last year that Wachovia and Wells Fargo laundered in a two and a half year period three hundred and seventy six billion dollars of narcotics money and even leased and ran the big aircraft to fly the stuff around I mean, and, and then they then they paid a tons of cocaine yeah they were they paid a, f a fine for having financed a, t a shipment of 22 tons of cocaine i think the 384 billion is what they were required by law to keep tabs on and didn't but they pleaded guilty to 112 million of, of drug money laundering, and that doesn't make them the big player here. Uh, the, according to a Canadian authority, every single major bank on Wall Street has been getting rich by laundering these funds. Well, no kidding. And and so and the I, issue here is the big banks are, are 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 full of this money, and they're not getting in trouble. And, and the big issue was they were you know leasing the aircraft uh, and and you know actually involved in the technicals of this. Uh, in closing, uh, 10 years after 9-11, we see the police state getting worse, the TSA, the checkpoints on the streets, uh, the face scanning cameras. Uh, in closing, uh, Peter Dell Scott, uh, looking at the war machine, clearly needing a new threat. That's why you've uh, written the new book, American War Machine, and of course it is the road to 9-11. What has 9-11 done to America and the rest of the world? What has that myth done? Well, um, you know, we can talk, it's certainly, uh, I'd like just to mention, it's not just 9-11, but it's these COG, continuity of government regulations that were implemented on 9-11, which the media never talk about, but which actually prescribed a regime for suspending the Constitution in certain respects. And that's why we got the Patriot Act and why we got uh, the suspension of FISA why we got warrantless detention and uh, the uh, Homeland Security's 10-year program, Project Endgame, for, to build detention camps to deal with uh, millions of people if necessary. And the budget for that program was $400 million in just one of the 10 fiscal years at stake. So uh, one can be very bleak about this, but I'd rather close on a more upbeat note because I think that the whole 9-11 story is really beginning to come apart. We're getting some very good science now uh, to show that there was nanothermite that helped blow up Building 7 and the Twin Towers. We're getting um, uh, this book again by Kevin Fenton which is about the illegal withholding of information from the FBI. This is a story that's going way beyond the 9-11 truth movement, bringing in major journalists. And uh, I think we're going to get congressional action on this, and I will be really disgusted with Congress if we don't. Well, I'm glad you raised that point, because as we investigate, we find more and more, just like Sybil Edmonds, who's now broken her gag order in the last year, was able to document the FBI translator it was narcotics, it was weapons, it was sex slavery, Al-Qaeda involved with the CIA up until the day of 9-11. I mean, this is just organized crime. And we do have a few minutes left. I'm glad you brought up COG. There's so many things that you've been a leading expert in, but that's probably what you've trailblazed to the greatest extent from my research. And I was about to raise the point when you brought up COG that it's basically already been implemented. That's how you see the Constitution being set aside. 
That's how you see Obama saying, I can launch wars without congressional approval. That's how you see uh, warrantless wiretapping and, and, and more and more FEMA in our local communities. I have reporters, we just had them on earlier, um, out in the field in Denver right now where they're practicing putting people in the local sports stadium and out of hundreds of drills going on at this event and over 100 agencies, that was the only thing they didn't advertise and that they don't want press at, but we were able to get in and talk to participants and it is just so frightening. And then you've got Glenn Beck coming out and saying we're liars, it doesn't exist, uh, when meanwhile they have the, uh, the Emergency Centers Establishment Act, we have the FEMA purchase orders for the emergency camps, we have Rex 84, the Iran-Contra hearings admitting it with Congressman Jack Brooks raising it, and they say that's national security, don't talk about it, Miami Herald's reported on it, you wrote about it 20-something years ago, and then you're talking about Houston Chronicle articles where they admit the 400 million, you know, that was years ago, for, for camps and civil emergency. We raise facts and they stonewall and say, camps? There's no such thing as camps. Meanwhile, I've got reporters on the ground witnessing them drilling to put political dissidents in camps, Peter. So in a, in a few minutes here, tell Homeland folks what's... Security. Homeland Security used to have it on their website until I wrote about it, and then they took it off their website. The thing that's public is it's hard to talk about uh, COG because, of course, it's all super secret. We know that Bush brought in some new COG rules in 2007, and uh, the Homeland Security Committee of the House wasn't allowed to see the rules. They were told they didn't have a high enough clearance to see those rules. That's a pretty good sign that the Constitution's going crazy just there. And another one is. You know, we have a National Emergencies Act, and it says if you proclaim an emergency, Congress has to review it within six months. We had an emergency proclaimed on September 14th, 2001. It's still in force. It gets renewed every year, and Obama has just renewed it for a third time. Congress is required by law to review that and hasn't done it. And when a, a congressman and I try to get a campaign going here, ask your congressman why this is not happening. And one congressman said, oh, well, that law was overruled, overridden by continuity of government. Well, if that's true, then that's clear evidence that we don't have our Constitution anymore. And you're bringing up, of course, Congressman DeFazio and others, people on the Homeland Security Committee, including the chairman, said, let us see the full uh, presidential decision directive for COG. The cover sheet said the president, for any reason, any crisis, including economic, can suspend Congress. And they were told, you're not high enough security clearance. And for those that don't know, the Congress is co-equal to the president in power, separation of powers, legislative, judicial, executive. If you really read what most of the founders said, and Thomas Jefferson, really, Congress, because it's more diverse, is really even more powerful than the president. And, and here's, the, here's, here's Bush saying, you can't see this. And now, as you said, Obama has continued this. This is, this is just dreadful. I know, and no political party is making an issue out of this. I'm very disappointed with the Tea Party because they want more limited government, but government is being stripped of its existing limitations in our lifetime before our eyes, and nobody is raising a complaint in Congress about this. The republic is dying with a whimper, not a bang. But you mentioned you mentioned that there is an awakening, and, and that's what I see traveling the country, doing radio shows, not just my own. Uh, the vast majority of people are really awake to 9-11 and other issues. They know they're being lied to. Confidence in this kleptocracy, this corporate fascist system is at an all-time low. Every poll shows that. But I saw a hoax for the uh, 10th anniversary I had reporter after reporter call me, TV, BBC, print, and say, how do you feel? And I'd say, wait a minute, after the fourth or fifth call, how do I feel now that 9-11 Truth's dead, right? And they go, how'd you know I was going to answer that? Well, that's the talking point. I've already gotten six calls this week, and then I got, you know, ten more. And, and, and I said, what your editor told you, that was what you were writing about? And they said, yeah. And I said, don't you see? So, so they're desperate if they're putting out a talking point that 9-11 Truth is dead. It's kind of like... You know, declaring Mark Twain was dead 20 years before he was dead. He said, rumors of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. They've got to be desperate to put this thing to bed so they can stage another terror attack. 
they have, you know, it's, it, it, the greater incredulity is on the one hand, they're saying that 9-11 truthers are a bunch of idiots who don't know their hands from their feet. And on the other hand, they're saying they're so dangerous that we, they actually have a man in the State Department and another man in the White House whose job it is to combat the 9-11 uh, truth movement, even though we're supposed to be a bunch of idiots. You know, I've, I went through years of uh, government obfuscation on the Kennedy assassination, but they never appointed people whose job it was to persuade people that Lee Harvey Oswald did it alone. This is a new development, thought control, that the Americans are being told that they have to think one way about 9-11 and we will fight anyone who thinks a different way. Peter Nell Scott, that is very well said. Um, that they've had to have Cass Sunstein and, and others, you know, White House regulations are saying our number one mission is infiltrate 9-11 truth, get them in fighting, put out ridiculous conspiracies to stop them. You know, they could bring us down, but then separately, ha, these people are morons. And we're yeah. like, but we have the police on tape saying, get back, they're going to blow up seven. And we have the hijackers being brought into the U.S. and protected. We have, you know, the head of the visa section at the embassy saying this. You know, we have thousands of pieces of evidence. We have the passports magically coming to the ground and being found. We, we have all this common sense stuff. And their answer is, oh, you're just a bunch of kooks. But in their internal memos, they're like, we've got to stop them. And I've talked to Wayne Matson, who's confirmed they have a whole 10 year unit in the NSA to spy on American government workers and officials and to stop leaks on 9-11. What does that tell you right there in the final close? Well, I just want to, because you have, you have a big audience here, much bigger than I normally get, and uh, what they should be demanding that the political process of this country deal with the law-breaking that has gone on about 9-11, the CIA withholding vital information from the FBI, vital information that could have prevented 9-11 from happening. Congress looked at this once, and uh, most of their, or, uh, uh, most of the relevant part of their report is still withheld. That report should be released in toto, and there should be a new investigation. And people listening to this show, it's their job to get Congress to do its job. It certainly is. Mr. Scott, uh, is there any particular site or book you'd like to point people towards? Well, uh, <laughs> I point towards my own book. American War Machine, which you can get on Amazon, or and I definitely, for people who want to get into the, the smaller points, but the technical points, this new book by Kevin Fenton, Disconnecting the Dots. You see that the, the CIA had the dots connected, and then they disconnected them for the FBI. That's for people who are, want to do it, well, you might say a graduate course on 9-11, but it's a very good book. Yeah, the deep minutia, but that's where you find it, the devils and the details. Peter Dell Scott, Professor, great having you on with us. Thank you very much. Well, that's it for this extended transmission, another week of InfoWars Nightly News. I want to remind all of the viewers out there that all of this is listener-supported. And if you'd like to spread the word about the broadcast, please become a subscriber to PrisonPlanet.tv. This has been a very powerful interview. I'll probably re-air it when I'm live this Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m. And if you don't have a local AM or FM affiliate for that show, you can always listen on the free streams at InfoWars.com. Well, have a safe and blessed weekend. We will defeat this tyranny. We don't have a choice. I'm Alex Jones signing off from the front lines of the InfoWar. See you back here live 7 o'clock next Monday.